Today's sermon comes from Psalm 103, verse 1 through 18. And this is the word of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. This is the word of God. Once again, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, I want to turn your attention to Psalm 103, this text. And the aim and the goal of this message is simple. That at the end of this message, the along with this Psalter, the one who sings this, that you may say and praise, Bless the Lord, O my soul, with joy, with thankfulness, with worship from your heart. Like, I want to praise him. That's my goal. That's the aim of this message. This psalm is a psalm of praise. This psalm is a psalm of worship, psalm of thanksgiving. There is no mention of enemy, no mention of vengeance, no mention of disappointment, sorrow, sadness, or prayer, or request. As we can see often from many other psalms in the Bible, there's none of those in this psalm. It begins with praise from the personal worship. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And then it goes to the people of God and it goes to the universal worship. If you see the end of this psalm, it says, All oh, you, his angels, you mighty one, bless his holy name. And then he ends with the personal worship again. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. This is a psalm of praise. Another characteristic of this psalm is that this is very gospel-saturated psalm. It is like the Old Testament gospel psalm. This psalm is about the eternal salvation that God brings to his people. So I believe this psalm has been loved by many believers in many generations. And like the song that we sang earlier this morning, Bless the Lord, oh my soul, is based on this psalm too. Third characteristic of this psalm that I can say is that this psalm is a personal worship to Yahweh. I don't know if you notice it or not. No other name is used in this psalm except capital L-O-R-D throughout this psalm. There's no word God. It's just Lord, Lord, which in Hebrew, we, even though it is written in capital L-O-R-D in English, Hebrew it means Yahweh. The personal, the covenantal name of God, which God revealed himself through Moses to the people of Israel in relationship. I shall be your God, you shall be my people. This covenantal relationship, personal, intimate name that they share with God. So this person is saying, God who chose us, God who blessed us, God who made us his, God who made that covenant with me, him I bless. 
I bless and praise that Yahweh throughout the psalm in their covenant relationship with him. And it begins in this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. This is a call for worship, but not towards other people. People, bless him, praise him. That's not what he's doing. He's commanding his own soul, himself, his inner being. All that is within me, bless his holy name. With his mind, his understanding, logic, feeling, emotion, all that is within him, that which consists his soul, he says, bless him, praise him. There is no harp playing before him. There is no majestic trumpet sounds playing before him. There is no mood set for him to, oh, I want to praise, I want to bless him. If I put it in a modern way, there is no house music playing. Oh, yes, it's just like, like I want to sing. Wanna... There's no piano playing beautiful hymn. No guitar strings making the set in the tone of the worship. No praise band. No dim light. No fog machine. No laser light pumping up the crowd. Like, I want to sing. Nothing. There's nothing outside of him setting the tone of worship. He said, praise him, my soul. How does he awaken that praise and thanksgiving and worship within him? This is how, the, how he does. Look at verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefit. That's how he does. Forget not all his benefit. With his mind, with his remembrance, understanding, he goes one by one, counting the blessing of God, and he says, don't forget the benefit, the blessings that God has given to me, to his people. This is where the praise and thanksgiving begins. Reflecting upon the blessing of God, his saving grace, over and over, he dips his mind and heart into the pool of God's love and grace again and again and again until his heart is saturated by that. Like, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I remember that. I remember that. Yes, God, I remember that. He's telling said, don't forget. My soul, don't forget. All, did you hear that? All his benefit. Forget none of it. And he uses his understanding, his mind, and he wants to know every benefit, every mercy. Don't miss what God has done for you. This is why I encourage you, hope of glory, everyone in this place, to study his word. Because sometimes we don't even know all aspect of his blessing. This is why you need to learn and know that your worship, your thanksgiving, your praise may go deeper. You need to know all spectrum of his benefit for you. I remember that when I was young on a Thanksgiving, pastor asked us to write down on a paper some things that you are thankful for. How much can you write? I could only write something that new things happened to me during that time, like I remember something. But how can we write every blessing that God has given to us? Every aspect of life, we move, we live, we breathe in Him. Everything that we have, touch, feel, is given from God. 
None of us can remember or count every blessing that comes from God. His mercies are new every day, every morning. His mercies are new for you every moment of your life. All the protection, all the provision, you are sustained by God. Your life, your inner being, your faith, your outer being, every aspect of your life is sustained by God. We can go everywhere when we think about the blessing of God. But this person's altar begins with this. This is how and where he begins his praise as he counts all the benefit of God. He says, who forgives all your iniquity? He begins with that. Who forgives all your sins? It's all, not just small things, it's something forgivable. Not just the, some big major sins. He forgives all my sin. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's the good news. That's the first thing that we hear from the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God forgives all of your sins. He does not hold anything against you. He does not hold any grudges against you. In fact, Isaiah said, He does not remember your sins. He will never. But remember the last time you did this? He will never do that. It's gone. You're saying when you were in college, when you were in high school, when you were little, or yesterday, or last week, all your sin, or even in the future, in Christ Jesus, all forgiven. That's the good news. That you don't have to deal with it. The guilt and shame and fear. Is like, <sighs> and he goes, who heals all your disease? Yes, God heals all our disease. Every healing and every recovery from sickness and disease, they are from God. You were sick, but now you are okay. It is, the healing is from God. You are not in pain today. It is from God. The medicines are God's gift. And I believe that every healing comes from the Lord in His mercy. But, but, what is in view here when He says, who heals all your disease, I don't think the physical healing is in view here. That's not what it means here. For example, Isaiah 33, 22 and 24 says this, For the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. In verse 24 it says, No inhabitant will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Once again, healing and the forgiveness are paired together in this verse. In the Bible, when it talks about our sins, our heart is desperately sick. So the healing here is talking about the healing of your soul. That your inner being were desperately sick. But God set you free from the power of sin, from the slavery of sin. He heals you. He sets you free. He forgives. So if I put this in a New Testament language that we like to use, it will be forgiving all sin, justification. Cleansing all your inner being, sanctification. They are in view here. Justification and making you holy and righteous. Sanctification heals your entire being. And our physical and our inner being, complete healing will be on that day. And he goes... Father, more benefit. That's not the end. Verse 4, who redeems your life from pit? Salvation, redemption, 
from the pit. What does that mean? In the Bible, pit means the grave. We are talking about resurrection here. He saves you, and He will give you resurrection. That's what it means. And not only that, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The God who made the heaven and earth the most high. The most high, whom the even angels tremble and fear. The most high, crowning you with what? Steadfast love and mercy. Picture that church. Crowning you with his steadfast love. What is steadfast love? In the Hebrew word that is hesed, it's a committed love. It is a covenantal love. It is unchanging love. It does not change based on your performance. It's committed to you. The hesed love. And then actually in this psalm, the Psalter explain and go over them more deeper. If you look into verse 8, would you? Verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Hold on. Is that how you view God? Or do you see God as if he is always seeking a moment to punish you? He does not deal with you according to your sin. He does not repay you according to your iniquity. He doesn't. The devil wants you to have a crooked vision of God. As if God is always seeking for opportunity and moment to punish you. If he did... If he dealt with us according to what we deserve, none of us will be here. But instead of that, he bestowed his steadfast, committed love. I am committed to you. More than husband and wife, they are committed to each other. God say, I'm committed to you. The love for your good. He crowns you with that. And verse 11, it goes, For as high as heavens are above the earth, so great is steadfast love. This is how great it is. To door towards those who fear Him. As high as heavens are. This expression in the Bible is an infinite expression. As they see and stand and see the moon and the stars and the sun, like, how high is that from the earth? The earth will never reach up there. The earth will never reach up there. This is infinitely high. That's how high his steadfast love is. And it goes further. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is another expression of infinity. You go one direction east, the other direction west, and infinitely goes to that direction. That's how far. And verse 17 again. Look at verse 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. That is another expression of infinity. The love of God that committed has said love for you, when did it begin? Not when you start to come to church. Not when you become a believer it says from the everlasting from the eternity past and it goes to eternally for to everlasting this love for you is eternal in its character while we were still sinners he loved us Before you have anything, you have done anything good or anything bad, before you were even born, He set His love on us from everlasting to everlasting. His love for you is infinite 
in its character, infinite it is length, infinite it is depth, infinite it is strength, it is infinite, eternal love. Who can fathom the love of God for you? He who did not withhold his one and only son for us, whom he loved from all eternity perfectly, in perfect unity and harmony, but gave his own son for us to the cross. That's his love. The love not only he had on you, he knew you, he supplied you, he holds you, he called you, he planted faith in you, he caused you to trust in him and repent, and he caused you to walk in righteousness and holiness, he protects you, he will keep you, and he will raise you up on the last day of resurrection, and he will glorify you and crown you. That love. God who gave us the hope of eternal life and joy. God who satisfies us. That's where he's going again. If we go back to verse 5, verse, verse 5, and then he says, Who satisfies us with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles? Now, church, are you with me? Think of all the goods that God has granted in your life, both physical and spiritual, that He satisfied you, His protection and His provision, both in spiritual and physical. All the good, the house you live. It may not be the most fancy, luxurious, biggest house in the world, but. After a long day, you go home and, oh, my house is a blast. Oh. After a long trip, you come home, like you're satisfied. Oh, I can relax and rest. Who satisfy you? The car you drive, the food you eat, the places you go, the things you enjoy, things you entertain yourself things you take pleasure, the people, the family that you laugh together, you enjoy together, the people around you who will cry with you, who care for you. Oh, what kind of blessing and good that he has given to you. The people whom he has planted in your life to comfort you, to minister you, to strengthen you, to refresh your heart, to renew your mind. How he answered your prayers. Even when we ask and forget about it, he remember he answered, he carries your new babies, your new house, your children, your friends, your work, your school, the rest you can enjoy. What kind of encouragement God has given to you? What kind of refreshing joy that God has given to you? Count all the benefit. And then we go. Bless the Lord my soul. My soul! Bless him and forget not all his benefit. This will kindle praise and thanksgiving and worship from and within your heart. Last Monday was, uh, as you knew, was a Veterans Day, so my son Dal did not go to school and stayed at home. And I probably said it before, my son loves playing video games. It's like Mario is his favorite thing. So normally, my wife and I, we don't let him play games during the weekdays. He can only play in the weekday, weekends. But since he was at home and he couldn't play much during the weekends, so I let him play. Like I called my son, hey, you're home, you don't go to school, so you can play a game today. 
And you can imagine my son was so excited, so happy, like, I love you, Abba. He gave me a hug and kiss. You know, he was so happy about that. So he played a game, not played a lot on that day, like it made him to take a break here and there. By the nighttime, I told him, yeah, you got to turn off the game in five minutes. You got to take a shower and you got to go to sleep now. He didn't like that. So it's like, no, no, but please, please, more, please, more. I was like, no, you played a lot today. Just five minutes, you got to turn it off. And all of a sudden, he was getting angry. And he came to me and said, like, you're so mean. I don't like you. I was like, guess what? I had to make him to stand in front of me. I was like, come here, stand right there. And I began to talk to him, pal. You know that you shouldn't play a game on weekdays. Monday is not your day to play a game. But it was my special treat to you, my special kindness to you, that I let you play a game all day long almost, long time. And you don't see that. And just because I didn't let you play a game in an extent that you wanted, that you desired, Now I'm mean? Now I'm mean to you? And you don't see all the thing? But just because of that? So wrong. So ungrateful. And after that, I thought about it. And it was not just my son. We are just like that. It's just the nature of sinners. All the blessing that God has given to us, has done for us, and we don't count that, we don't see that, we forget about that, but we only magnify that what is not given to me. What other people have, but not me. I don't have this. How come I don't get to enjoy this? How come I don't get to have this? Like, uh, God doesn't want me to be happy. We just focus on that, that, just magnifying what we do not have. Remember Adam and Eve? I shared this at the singles retreat too. Do you remember how the serpent deceived Adam and Eve? The serpent made the Adam and Eve just focus on what was not given to them, permitted to them. All the fruit and all the trees and everything they can have and enjoy in the Garden of Eden. All the blessings of God. They forget about it and a serpent may say, See the tree? He's keeping good things up from you. He doesn't want you to have that. See? See? And they're just focusing on that. How come I don't have this? How come I don't have that? Not looking at all the blessing. Just this. And the person falls into self-pity. Feeling sorry for oneself. Ah, poor me. And angry, a bitter, depressed. Like, how come I don't have a special person, like intimate person or spouse like other people? How come I don't have a children like that? How come I don't have a healthy child like that? How come I don't have a house like that? How come I don't have a financial flexibility like other people? How come I don't have the full-time job? How come I don't have that kind of school? How come I don't have the God? Just, just, just that. And I'm, there's no thanksgiving. There's no joy. There's no praise. There's no worship. It's like, ah, my life. How sad is that? How sad is that? There's no soul awakening, joy, worship, thanksgiving in that person. You probably heard this poem before. It is a very famous poem. Um, It's such a philosophical poem written by a teenager. I think that is why it got more popular and famous. And uh, he really does make us to think. And it goes like this. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but the fall I wanted, the colorful leaves, the cool, dry air. 
It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of holiday seasons. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth, the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle-aged I wanted, the presence of mind without limitation. My life was over. Over, but I never got what I wanted. And I will add to that. Single people want, I want to get married. How come I don't have someone? Married people say, I want to have a child. And the people who has infant and toddlers like, I want my kids to be like theirs. It's so hard parenting. And then big kids parents like, Teenagers are dealing with teenagers so hard. I want, oh, how cute. I want to go back there. Like, cutie, they listen. I like that. And then they leave. Parents are like, oh, at least if they were in the house, you know, it was better. I miss them. It just feels so empty just being me and my husband, me and my wife. Never. Never condemn. Never see the blessing of God given to that person in that moment. Never enjoy. Would you sing with this altar? Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your disease? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He may know his ways to Moses, his deed to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, but abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquity. As High as heavens are above the earth, so great is steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are thus. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and his place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. His faithfulness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord established his throne in heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, all you, his angels, you mighty ones, who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers, who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his words, in all places of his dominion. And he goes, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, my soul. Command your heart, church. Be thankful. Forget not all his benefits.